Oh my dearest mama. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> they burnt everything down. And I've only got one set of dining gowns. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dexter and welcome to my channel, where I discuss all things Caribbean history and genealogy. I've traced my ancestors in the Virgin Islands back to the 18th century. And along that journey, I became fascinated with Virgin Islands history. In this video, I'll explore a dramatic chapter in Virgin Islands history, the Great Riots of 1853, also known as the Cattle Tax Riot, the week that road town burned. But before I jump into the video, please hit that subscribe button. If you watch to the end, I will break down some of the key nuances. In 1844, 10 years after slavery was abolished in the British Empire, and six years after the end of the apprenticeship system, the assembly of the Virgin Islands began levying taxation on the formerly enslaved population of the islands. The economic situation in the islands deteriorated in the years after abolition and apprenticeship. The compensation paid to slave owners was being directed towards new opportunities like mining, which was pursued on Virgin Gorda, but the copper ore discovered there was quickly depleted. In England, money was poured into manufacturing, steelworks, railways, and other innovations of industrialization. Meanwhile, the British state was investing heavily in the pursuit of securing new colonies rich in raw materials to feed the voracious appetite of British industry. The Virgin Islands and much of the West Indies were no longer profitable. Funnily enough, having to pay wages made it difficult to turn a profit. Who knew? Britain made little to no effort to develop the islands and they fell into economic irrelevance. The islands were heavily dependent on goods made in Europe, but had little income to afford them, forcing the people to rely on subsistence farming and fishing to sustain themselves. At this time, Virgin Islanders grew just enough produce to feed their families and the wider community on small plots of land leased from landowners. Any surplus available for export was rather small. They also read animals like sheep, goats and pigs, but it was cattle farming that generated the most income. Trade with the neighbouring Danish West Indies and Dutch West Indies, so St. Thomas and St. Eustatius, was a vital lifeline to the people of Tortola. St. Thomas and St. Eustatius, they were long established free ports, so ships transporting goods would go to these ports to replenish their provisions or to be repaired during long journeys from Europe and North America. Young men would leave Tortola to work on these ports. They would often take surplus produce or handcrafted goods with them to sell on the behalf of relatives back home. The proceeds from any sales would then be used to buy essentials which would then be taken back to Tortola on their return. Some of these young men even became shipwrights in the merchant navy or migrated further afield to find work so they could make remittances to support those they left behind. At this time in history, both political participation and hegemonic power were directly determined by the ownership of income-generating assets like agricultural land and property. The ability to be represented and the right to vote was reserved for men owning significant property and earning meaningful levels of income each year. This largely excluded the black population of Tortola, which was still finding its feet post-abolition. Taxes and export duties were levied on the primary sources of income of the formerly enslaved, namely cattle and sheep. A 5% tax was placed on all houses valued at £10 or greater, about £1,000 in today's money. 
and all incomes over £50 were taxed, except those of public officers paid directly from central government in Whitehall in London. Yes, what I'm saying is that the predominantly white English and Scottish civil servant class paid no taxes on their income. On top of this, vessels used to take goods to sell in St. Thomas or further afield had to be licensed and taxed or else those vessels would be seized. But the ownership of land was conspicuously left untaxed. This means that anyone employed by the local government or local businesses or any of those reliant on the export of produce to neighboring islands was suddenly faced with new financial obligations. The impact of this was compounded by the introduction of new import duties on all imports into the Virgin Islands. These taxes triggered a resurgence of the infamous smuggling trade, which made it even more difficult for the local treasury to collect taxes, further compounding the dire financial situation faced by the territory. By 1847, income tax and house tax were doubled and all vessels, including those not used for export trade, were brought into the vessel licensing scheme. Tensions escalated after the revolt of the enslaved population in St. Croix in 1848, an act that directly led to the abolition of slavery in the Danish West Indies and stoked an air of revolution in the British islands. A group of shopkeepers in Town had had enough and set upon the stipendary magistrate Isidore Diet, giving him a severe beating. This physical assault was a harbinger of things to come a few years later. In June 1853, the Assembly of the Virgin Islands imposed an extra sixpence tax on each head of cattle, a 50% increase from one shilling to one and a half shillings a levy that fell principally on the rural black population, referred to as the country people. The assembly enacted the tax rise on 1st August 1853, the 19th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. The assembly also resolved to heavily enforce all levies and taxes for the first time. What on earth were they thinking? Was this done out of contempt? Was it done out of retaliation for the beating of the magistrate in 1848, or was it tactless incompetence, or all of the above? Whatever the reason, things did not go well. Methodist missionaries, who were themselves battling with the assembly for permission to petition Queen Victoria for funding to aid their efforts at providing education to the black population, advised their angry parishioners to go to the treasury, explain their plight, and offer to adhere to paying the old lower tax. When this was refused, the situation deteriorated and an estimated 1,500 people stormed Road Town. Instead of trying to listen to the concerns of the angry and impoverished population, the riot act was read and two arrests were made. The crowd vowed to return, and the very next day, on 2nd August 1853, as many as 2,000 people armed with clubs and staves re-entered Road Town, demanding the release of the two prisoners. Chief Judge Daniel H. O. Gordon advised them to take up their unhappiness with the President of the Assembly, Colonel Chads. The protesters appealed to President Chads to repeal the tax, but to no avail. The night before, Colonel Chance had deputized an armed volunteer corps with muskets. This collection of 20 or so men were ordered to shoot. Word soon spread across the island that a protester had been shot dead. The people of Tortola were incensed with rage and violence erupted that day. The events that transpired over the following week were truly extraordinary. The constables and magistrates present were beaten and pelted with stones. Fire was set to buildings across Road Town, and much of the capital was burnt to the ground. All over the island, country houses were ransacked, pulled down, 
or their contents ripped apart. And the white population, including the very assembly members that instituted the tax, fled to St. Thomas, leaving the president of the assembly, Colonel Chads, to request assistance from the Danish. Under the protection of 20 Danish soldiers, he had to wait 10 days for English troops, about 175 of them, to arrive from Antigua, while Town lay in ruin. Interestingly, the Methodist Society Church building, which doubled as a school, and the properties of its leaders were all spared, as were the properties of more sympathetic white landowners and black elites of the island. The riot was eventually suppressed, and 23 more protesters were imprisoned, with three of them being sentenced to death. It is said that more were not jailed, as the prison was over capacity and the territory did not have the money to look after more prisoners. What is even more astonishing is that the riot was labelled an insurrection and made global news. It was serialised across the British Empire with a first-hand account of Caroline Gordon, the chief judge's wife, being published in the London Morning Herald, the London Evening Standard, the St. James's Chronicle, the Morning Post and the Sydney Morning Herald. Yes, that's Sydney, Australia. News of the riots shocked the world, making headlines in the USA, in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and it was also heavily covered across Europe, with multiple mentions in Dutch and Danish newspapers. A moral panic gripped the colonialist consciousness as they feared the Virgin Islands riots could inspire ambitions for a new Saint-Domingue. That is, a new majority black republic like the one formed after the Haitian Revolution. There are so many layers to unpick here, as this chapter in the Virgin Islands story has many nuances that I could not explore in this video. But what a story! If only Andrew Levy was still alive to write a screenplay about this. I mean, BBC, what are you doing? The point of this is that the island's population was not passive. They were very much aware, engaged, and ready to voice their concerns and take action. The circumstances were indeed extreme. Now imagine being born enslaved, then watching your parents be forced to work as low-wage apprentices to the same people that enslaved your entire family, then being asked to pay taxes to support a government that won't even pay for you or your children to receive a primary school level education, a system by the children of the very people that enslaved you, the same people that you must also not pay to lease the land on which you were enslaved on and now depend on to eat and have done so for nearly 20 years. Now framed this way, you can understand why the anger was so deeply felt. What I find interesting about this whole event is that many of the protesters were said to be women. Women who were described as being at the forefront and the most skilled of arsonists. Also, the most widely publicized first-person account was also that of a woman, Caroline Gordon, the wife of the judge, and this was done in her own right. But I suspect this was done deliberately to try to shock the public in Europe so there would be no sympathy for the plight of the protesting black population. Overall, I think the five years between the revolt in 1848 and the cattle tax riot in 1853 marked the beginning of a collective majority black consciousness in the Virgin Islands. More work is needed to examine these events, but from what I can tell, they demonstrate a strong will to achieve autonomy through collective bargaining, with threats of violence very much being acted upon, but only used as a last resort. When violence was employed, it was not perpetrated indiscriminately. It was in a targeted fashion in line with achieving specific goals. Now, Violence certainly is not the best way to settle disagreements, but these truly were desperate times. If you like this video, please remember to hit the 
like button and subscribe to my channel. It really helps others to find my content. See you in the next one.